do I start now? No, we're okay. good. Yes, hello, sorry everyone. Um, my name is Guido Schmidtrap. I'm the Executive Director of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, um, working with Professor Sachs and many other global leaders to, at the time, we helped define, develop um, and design the Sustainable Development Goals and played a significant role in the Paris Climate Agreement. And now our global network that, I'm, that you've heard about um, is um, engaged in, um, in supporting the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. So we really work across a, a very broad spectrum and um, I look forward to, um, to answering your questions and, um, and discussing the, the, the practicalities of um, advancing sustainable development with you. Thank you so much. So um, actually, can you tell us a little bit about your work and how you came to the field of sustainable development and also how your work works with the six transformation pathways? Okay, um, great pleasure. So my own background is a, is a bit of an unusual one. I've got, um, I'm a scientist, um, a physical um, atmospheric chemist, um, but also an economist. And then later on, actually during my, during my work, I did a, I did a PhD in economics. Um, and I really found that to be uh, very, very helpful and insightful. I find the, the rigor of the scientific training extremely helpful in my day-to-day -day use. And of course, many of the challenges that we're dealing with have a scientific foundation, um, but the economics is obviously also useful. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time really connecting um, the different, um, different pieces. Um, so one of our core areas um, of focus is on um, uh, supporting countries in developing the tool, implementing the tools and developing, really understanding how to plan for longer term pathways towards achieving these long term objectives. That's not a trivial question. You know, if you're, if you're the government of Colombia, Ethiopia, or even a developed country, let's take the United States, you know, what should be your long term policy on um, on sustainable food systems and agriculture, noting that they, of course, are major drivers of greenhouse gas emissions, but also biodiversity loss. These are, these are challenges that defy easy answers. And what we're seeing is that in many places, countries don't actually have the analysis um, to, to even, uh, they, they don't have the tools and they don't have the analysis to understand what the impact of different policy options might be on, on these um, sometimes competing objectives. And so we're seeing policies adopted in some countries that that might be well targeted to, towards a specific objective, but then have a lot of negative consequences and other sustainable development goals, um, which undermines, of course, their effectiveness, but also their longer term um, success. So, so that's something that, that we work on a lot. Um, and, and of course, governments are asking, not just governments, but also private sector leaders, many others are asking, okay, well, well, how do we actually operationalize these sustainable development goals? Um, it's 17 goals. We know I like them. They're, they're very good. They cover the main issues. But we also know that they're the outcome, the result of a, of a negotiation between 193 governments. So we shouldn't expect them and we can't expect them to have been framed um, precisely for, 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 operation or for, for, for implementation. And so obviously a country wouldn't have 17 strategies to achieve the SDGs because these issues are connected. Um, poverty, for example, ending poverty is the outcome of, very, of a very broad range of multifaceted um, policies and measures. And so one of the things that, um, that we're working on indeed are the six, what we call the six transformations. It's basically the question of, you know, if you were to frame the SDGs as an operational agenda, what are the main the main transformations that you need to pursue. What are the what are the issues, the goals, the, um, the topics that really need to be um, looked at together because they are so deeply connected, integrated. So, for example, you can't look at biodiversity without also looking at agriculture. Agriculture being the main driver or a major driver of, of biodiversity loss. That's just one example. So we do need to integrate, but on the other hand, we can't say that everything depends on everything because then um, then you don't start with anything and you don't really get anything done. So that's a it's a fine um, it's a fine balance. And we're coming out with what we call six major transformations. And let me just let me just mention them briefly and then perhaps hand over to the questions. Um, um, without any particular order and certainly no prioritization, the first transformation is um, is for health and well-being, really looks at, um, at an inter takes an integrated look at at, 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 at human health but also uh, well-being as measured, for example, by the happiness community. So this is really a broad nexus. There's also, there are also challenges of, of environmental health in there as well. Um, second is um, the whole nexus of education 
uh, job skills training, gender and inequality, because we know that the education system is a major driver um, of inequality or it can be a major motor of overcoming inequality. Obviously, a lot of gender inequalities are, uh, are mediated through the education system. There's much more to gender equality, of course, than, than, than just education, but it's a big, big part. So that's one. That's another important nexus. We believe that these issues we need to be looked at together. Third, we have uh, clean energy and, uh, and industry. So this is this is a challenge of decarbonizing energy systems while in developing countries, of course, ensuring that everyone has access to clean energy. So there's both an energy access um, and a decarbonization component. Um, and, there, and there is also the important issue of how do we make industry uh, more sustainable by reducing waste, uh, reducing resource use, and promoting what some call a circular economy. Next, the fourth transformation looks at the rural side of things. So this is um, um, integrated food systems and land use. So this is where you're getting to food security, uh, food production more generally, then the, um, and, then, and then of course the environmental uh, impacts or, or components of this, which are biodiversity, biodiversity loss in many instances, uh, sustainable use of water resources, greenhouse gas emissions, um, that's a whole very complex nexus, and of course, there's an important social side to this, not least of all the, the smallholder farmers. Then uh, the fifth one is the, is the urban, um, equivalent to that, the urban transformation cities. Um, and then finally, we're looking at digital technologies as a, as a major transformation that not only enables uh, progress in the other areas, but is a, is a major transformation in and of itself, because it really promises to transform completely the way in which governments work, governments service so often, but obviously also um, uh, the area of work with uh, many positive um, impacts, but also uh, a number of challenges that need to be understood and managed carefully. So those are those are sort of six broad transformations and love to also get comments from people on the call, but something that we're finding to be quite useful in discussions with government who, uh, who feel that these are issues that also capture um, some of the some of the needs and priorities of the political constituents. Constituents. Happy to discuss them more, but maybe we go into into the into the Q and A session. Yes, definitely. Okay, so actually, our first question that we have from a learner is: Do you think that we can achieve the SDGs without a concerted effort to increase to address increasing global population trends, especially beyond 2030? Because uh, this learner said that this is not addressed in any of the SDG targets. Yes. So, so the issue of population is a is a very complex one. It's a deeply political one, and there are reasons why why this topic is not in the SDGs. Those are essentially political reasons, um, because in particular African countries have bristled at the idea of being told to reduce their population size by the former colonial powers, the Europeans. That's often been the dynamics. And second, that's that's one a political dimension. The other political dimension is that there have been um, and they continue to be in, in a very few places, but in some places, uh, blatant abuses of human rights. So, for example, under, under the Indian emergency or under in the early years of the China one child policy, you had forced abortions um, and women were denied the right to decide how many children they have. So that's why this issue is very, the, the term population is, is very controversial and there are people um, that, are, that have argued against including this in the sustainable development goals. On the other hand, it's obviously it's also clear that's implied by the question that a growing population makes it harder to meet um, the challenges of sustainable development because there are more mouths to feed, there are more people if you want to consume resources, and so it just obviously makes it much harder. So yes, overall we need to we need to reduce fertility rates through voluntary means. That's very important to address the human rights component, um, and that has to be an important priority. But we should also note that. The, the so-called global population growth is very limited. Is, is a very geographically um, concentrated phenomenon because actually many countries, China, almost all of Europe, um, Southeast Asia actually has declining populations. And if you take immigration out, the population of I believe every developed country, every every OECD country is, or at least uh, European and Northern American country is declining. Um, the population growth today, the fertility rates are highest in the poorest countries. So um, Afri Sub-Saharan Africa, the Horn of Africa, parts of, um, parts of the Middle East, uh, parts of Central America have got extremely high fertility rates, and that's where they need to come down. Um, that is absolutely clear. Um, they need to come down uh, not just for environmental reasons. Um, I would say chiefly 
um, as a way to uh, meet the human rights of, of mothers who most women do not want to have five or six or seven children um, and to ensure that households and countries can invest in the smaller number of children so you get better human capacity, be better skills, better employability, better prospects for, um, uh, for gainful employment and later adult life. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So our next question about something that's not addressed in the SEGs or this person thinks so is that uh, the learner said, should there be more of a focus on consuming and producing less overall in the SDGs in addition to sustainable consumption and production and trans transitioning to circular economies? Um, should we be setting global limits to the amounts of resources that can be in circulation in the economies of the world? Yeah, I think we need to, um, so in principle the answer is yes, but I think we need to be clear about what we mean by consuming less and what, what consumption we're talking about. Um, and that's often confused. So if you take climate change, the problem isn't necessarily that, that, isn't necessarily that, that humans will consume more energy um, moving forward. I think, I mean, while there is a big potential for energy efficiency, overall energy consumption will go up. That's not really the problem. The problem is that we are producing or generating the, the, the electricity, in particular and the power, using fossil fuels. So it's the greenhouse gas emissions that, that are critical. So in many instances, really, the, the main challenge is to, is to decouple um, human well-being, living standards from the environmental impact of, um, uh, particularly the environmental impact of, um, of the resource use. And this may be through by shifting to shifting to new technologies like renewables versus fossil fuels. This may be through efficiency um, uh, measures. This might this might be through recycling and so forth. And there are undoubtedly many areas where the consumption of natural resources today exceeds what um, what humans um, uh, what 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 the Earth can carry, the, the carrying capacity of the Earth. And here. Uh, we need to reduce overall human impact, and this does require per, uh, per capita reductions in human uh, consumption. The trick, though, is to find ways in which this can be done without um, a significant negative impact on human well-being and, and talent of living, um, because otherwise it'll be very hard to get these things through. Okay, so uh, you, d you discussed standards. And uh, one learner asks, how can standards like standards from the ISO or the International Organization for Standardization and quality improvement approaches contribute to achieving the SDGs, mainly the ones that are related to industry production and consumption? It's a really good question. And the answer is um, that they play an important role and, and they do so in many different ways. If you look at how the issue of sustainable consumption and production in Europe, it's called circular economy, is dealt with in, in, in Europe, a lot of it happens through such, uh, such, such industry standards. So, for example, we have now efficiency standards for most household appliances. We even have maximum power standards. So you say that in order to, um, to vacuum clean your house, you don't need the strongest possible engine um, because that just unnecessarily uses more power. So those things are being, are being regulated, standards are set, uh, and that's uh, uh, not loved by everyone. Um, some in the industry don't like this, but it's proven, I think, I would say quite, um, quite effective. I think the real question um, is, uh, or so I would say that the next question after this basic principle, and I think we clearly need more of that, particularly in other developing, in, in other regions. I think many of the emerging economies, uh, many developing countries have quite weak standard setting bodies. Um, they need to be strengthened because they really are a main, they can be an important conduit towards greater resource efficiency. But there's another question which I wanted to come to briefly, and that's namely the question of, what are the standards that we need that we need move moving forward? Um, and obviously, where we can where we can drive greater efficiency in resource use, including, for example, um, electricity, that's obviously um, uh, needed. But there are some areas where we also need to shift towards completely new and different um, uh, technology platforms. So, for example, you could have today you could focus on standards that increase the efficiency of the internal combustion engine, which is the normal fossil fuel driven engine that you have in, in, in in cars today, and that would certainly help. But I would argue, and I think the evidence shows clearly that the real question is how do you, how soon can we switch towards battery driven and other zero emission vehicles? And so that raises really, really interesting and important questions, questions for standard setting body. What are the pathways towards achieving the goals? What are the, techno what are the types of technologies that are needed? And how can standard setting bodies um, support and accelerate the, um, the transition towards these technologies? 
So you just addressed the switch to battery uh, operated cars instead of using fossil fuels. And actually one uh, learner just asked a question, which country could be described as a leader in decarbonizing the energy system? Which relates to that. <laughs> um, among the industrialized countries, um, I would say France. Um, that's controversial. Um, because the basically France is controversial because France um, generates about 70 to 80% of its power from nuclear power. And then the remaining 20% is essentially um, hydro um, renewables. So France is the only large economy that basically has a decarbonized um, power system. Um, others do too, Switzerland, but it's a small in Norway, but they are small countries where you have um, very large hydro potential. Norway, I would say, is a global leader in electrification of vehicles. Um, that's uh, that's uh, that's certainly moving forward. I would say that Sweden has got perhaps the most clearly thought out strategy for decarbonizing its power system. And and learners, you might have you might have noticed um, that last, or you might have seen that last week, Governor Brown of California announced um, the commitment for California to decarbonize power generation by 2045. That's a very very significant important commitment. It's the sixth largest economy in the world. If California were a country. Um, and so that is going to, I think, inspire many others. So in short, there are many, um, there are some examples of success. There are, there's nobody that's really gone all the way. Nobody has decarbonized the energy, energy system, including also transport buildings, et cetera, uh, completely. Um, and I would say very few currently are on track for two degrees Celsius pathway. So we need to really accelerate, but some countries are leading and uh, we need to broaden and, um, and, and, and build out that group. Okay, to switch gears completely. Um, so we're gonna go into the business sector now. Uh, one learner asks, can we rely on the private sector interests to reduce inequalities? And how can the private sector involvement in the implement implementation of the 2030 agenda be measured? Well, I think my clear answer to the first question would be an absolute no. Um, the private sector is, is terrible at uh, redistributing um, incomes, that's why countries with low, industrialized countries with low rates of inequality all have a, have a fairly strong redistributive system that includes um, public financing for health and education. And it also includes um, uh, income transfers. The Scandinavian countries are the best, are the clearest example of this. No system is perfect, but these are the ones that have, that have, that have been shown to work. I cannot think of a single country where government, where that, that has managed to reduce inequality without strong concerted efforts by governments. And one thing that private companies do not like is paying more taxes, but that's what they need to do in order to, to, to help finance these programs. Um, but I, wanted, I do want to turn this around and that is many private, private sector leaders are very worried about inequality. Um, it has many adverse um, consequences. Um, and, and so there's a growing chorus of private sector leaders to um, for governments to take on the fight against inequality, which is very welcome. We need to just make sure that this is also backed up with a commitment to raising the resources. Um, some Silicon Valley firms, for example, now argue for, for a universal um, income um, because uh, AI, so um, uh, advanced machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence, will displace, will likely displace many jobs. So there could be many more people finding having a hard time finding a job. And it's fine to offer them a, um, a universal income, but then these very same companies also need to be prepared to pay up, to pay their taxes, to pay their fair share of taxes, which quite frankly, they're not doing. Silicon Valley is not paying as fair taxes. How do you measure the private sector contribution? There are many different, this is complicated. There is um, a lot of work that's happening on this space right in the space right now. There's a world benchmarking alliance dedicated to this. There's a whole um, process of setting science-based targets for businesses. So I would say that we're making a lot of a lot of progress um, towards it. But it, um, happy to go into more detail. But it really involves um, a set of quantitative uh, measures called key performance indicators for companies. But then I would say also qualitative information of how the company behaves in its markets, how the company supports uh, national discussions of, for example, decarbonization or moving towards sustainable cities. So. It's um it's um it's it's not a it's not a trivial thing, but we are but we're making significant progress on that. And of course, the SCG Academy would be very happy to share material with interested learners on that. 
So you mentioned how governments are necessary to ensure standards. And one student from Uganda asks, what is the best way to ensure maintenance of labor standards in developing countries like Uganda, where there's a fear of loss of employment and high levels of corruption? Yes. Yeah, so I think we need to we need to separate out the labor standards and the corruption. Both are both are very important issues. Um, they, of course, have different causes and different uh, different remedies. Just to take a step back for this question, this question is also highly politicized. Um, and quite often you find trade unions in European countries advocating for labor standards in poorer countries and developing countries. And the governments of those developing countries saying, hang on a second, low wages are one of our comparative advantage, competitive and comparative advantages. So please don't go too far on your labor standards and environmental standards. We are, we are less wealthy and so our standards on some of these dimensions are lower and we need it in order to be competitive and as, we, as incomes rise, we will tighten our standards. I have sympathy for, of course, both positions, um, um, but it's, it's one that is, um, it, it's something that, that's really quite difficult to, um, uh, to, to arbitrate between because both are very valid positions. I think in the there are there's a whole toolbox um, um, that governments um, can and need to use, and ultimately governments once again will have to take will have to play an important role in in maintaining labor standards. The International Labor Organization (ILO) has put out a whole toolbox um, of policy measures, consultative mechanisms that governments and society um, can pursue. Uh, that's one angle, and then there are also global standard setting bodies, for example, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, just like the ILO, are engaged in um, in setting uh, labor standards or voluntary labor standards that global multilateral corporations can adhere to. And we're seeing this increasingly um, as a major uh, lever for change, where the the big some of the big global corporations, for example, Walmart, the one of the biggest, I believe it is the biggest, if not one of the one of the biggest, if not the biggest retailer in the world, um, but also major food companies like Unilever, Procter and Gamble, Nestle, um, are now requiring certain standards on labor and environmental safeguards and governance safeguards from all the companies contributing to their supply chain. And I think that's a very that's a very encouraging and very positive. Um, uh, direction and um, set of examples, but I would again hasten to add that they will not be sufficient. You also need strong government leadership in, in every country on this. Um, thank you. One of our learners just asked, what are the incentives that are available in the private sector that motivate them to participate in the circular economy? Um, well, it depends on the it depends on the industry. Um, there are many companies uh, and a growing number of companies that, that make their money um, through um, through the circular economy. So, for example, they may they may offer consulting services that, are, that allow um, uh, other companies to increase their energy efficiency or reduce their uh, the resource use. So that's an, that's an obvious example. You've got many new products that are coming on the market. So that's that's one set. So those those companies um, they see a big market opportunity. Um, then it's also obviously about 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 shifting wasteful and um, socially non-desirable behavior um, through um, uh, financial incentives or so tax incentives, um, um, for example, recycling. Um, in some places, I think Germany and Switzerland have got some of the most developed recycling schemes in the world. You have financial incentives for consumers and and, and companies to to recycle um, glass, uh, metals, and others. Um, and then also there is obviously also regulation which forbids certain things. I've mentioned the um, the efficiency standards, um, a very famous notorious example because it's very contested by at least one company in Europe is the aforementioned example of um, of vacuum cleaners that now have a maximum power, permissible power setting um, in order to um, to avoid um, uh, wasting energy. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one learner who is asking, how do we define social sustainability and how do the transformation pathways incorporate this idea? So that's another, another very good, um, good question. So in general, we, we, um, in general, we don't use the, the term sustainability overall because it, it tends to have an environmental bias connotation. That's where the term originally comes from. There's of course nothing nothing wrong with that, but sustainable development is famously about three, and some, including myself, would argue about four dimensions. So, of course, economic prosperity, 
uh, environmental sustainability, social inclusion, um, and then that all has to be underpinned by underpinned by framework of good governance and um, and peace. Um, and so social um, sustainability, we use the term social inclusion, is, is absolutely critical. Um, there are a number of measures for this um, that um, first you would look at, um, at, uh, at issues of income and wealth inequality. There's a number of metrics for that. The most common one is the Gini, which basically measures how far, how far the income distribution is, um, is away, how far away it is from a, um, uh, from a perfectly equally distributed um, um, uh, distribution. You have a Palmer ratio that basically takes the ratio of um, um, of the 20th to the 40th percentile in the income distribution, and you've got you've got many other metrics that look at different parts of the distribution. So that's that's clearly one. Um, and what we encourage countries to do, and you can look this up. You might have seen our our SDG index and dashboards report is something that comes out every year under on the website is sdgindex.org. There you'll find country profiles. There's a profile for your country there um, that measures or and describes your country's performance against certain goal against the SDGs. And for each of those, we have identified um, what it would mean to to hit the goals um, and to hit the targets. And so, for in, for income inequality, we believe that a useful threshold is are the low level, relatively low levels of income inequality achieved in Scandinavian countries. You cannot have a moment, you cannot have zero income inequality. Um, that's that's just not possible, and it's also not desirable um, because people should be remunerated for their work. Um, but you certainly can get much closer. We believe the Scandinavian countries are there. And in terms of other measures, um, under the um, under the same development goals, people use a leave no one behind principle, um, and that basically um, invites and um, requires countries to look at to look at a distribution um, of um, for example social services access to infrastructure and so forth and that's that's a really very important and useful exercise if you look at the SCG index report you'll see that we include a lot of measures there for example on geographic disparities is there a big difference between regions in the country or is, is the north um, better served than the south or the east or the west for example urban versus rural then you can look at disparities by age um, is there a discrimination of young people, for example? You can look at disparities, obviously, by gender, uh, by income groups, by ethnic minorities, and so. And these are not these are not easy to measure um, because you need big, large data sets for that. Um, but these are certainly, but they are issues that are um, that are well understood. There are lots of metrics there, and what we do is we advise and we call on governments to build out the statistical systems to develop the data in order to serve these needs because. Indeed, what you call social sustainability, um, what others call leave no one behind, yet others call it social inclusion, is an absolutely central part of the agenda. Um, and we're also, anyone who is looking at climate change purely as a technical question of how do you decarbonize uh, power, really forgets that um, we need um, social acceptability to, um, to be able to implement large-scale transformations. And we you also need a high degree of trust uh, within a country in order to uh, to manage the very complex uh, trade-offs that you have, social trade-offs, because every transformation will benefit some and will, will hurt other parts of the population. If you're a coal miner, then, um, then shifting towards renewables might mean the end of your job. And so society needs to form a view of that and needs to form a view on how these so-called losers um, of the transformation uh, can be compensated and how they can be supported to find a new uh, future. Otherwise, we're getting the kind of politics that we're seeing, unfortunately, increasingly in parts of the United States and, uh, and in parts of Europe and other, of course, also other, other regions of the world, Australia being another um, case in point among the developed countries. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that that closes us out. So thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, do you have any final comments? No, just um, want to encourage you all to to think hard about these issues. Um, every time somebody tells you there's an easy answer, there's an easy solution, you should be you should you should question that uh, because that's almost always not the case. Um, but just invite you to to continue this uh, this venture of um, of really trying to understand the issues and all the different facets, and then to apply knowledge to 
understanding what the solutions might be. Because as, as bizarre as it might sound, we do way too little of this. Um, and, um, and that can be a very rewarding career. It can be a very rewarding progression in your current job. Um, and it's something that, of course, the world needs. So, so thank you very much for spending the time with the SCG Academy. And I wish you well uh, in, this, in this course and in the, in the next steps in your careers. Thank you so much. Very good.